one. You know I'm right. Nick Durst here with Joe Calabrese. And Joe, we have a, a great guest on with us today. She's currently sitting in her SNY set. As you can see, the Latrell Sprewell jersey right over her right shoulder, one of the <laughs> greatest Knicks from the 90s. Joe, why don't you let our listeners know who we are speaking with today? Well, first things first, I love the Sprewell jersey. I uh, sent it to her a couple of weeks ago, so she'll appreciate that. Um, <laughs> she is a very, uh, we'll, we'll call her a rising superstar in the world of media. She currently does commentating. She's a TV radio host. Uh, she's worked for iHeart Radio. She does digital for Sports Illustrated. And like you too, uh, when she makes her appearances, you can catch her only on SNY. Uh, mm -hmm. I wish I had the energy that she does. So we'll <laughs> ask her how she, does, how she does it. But uh, the one and the only, Ashley Nicole Must. Ashley, thank you for joining us today. What's up? Thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, it's it's a lot going on. It's a lot when you say it out loud. It sounds a lot um a lot worse. Very, very you're, a, <laughs> you're a workaholic, which is great. I think you have to be a little bit in this in this business. You know, I think in order to kind of just not only um, upkeep appearances and relevancy. If you love what you do, it doesn't necessarily feel like work, except when you haven't eaten all day and you're running on, you know, E, but um, yeah, I mean, I love it. I love the grind. I love the hustle of, of everything that comes with this career choice. So it gets hectic. It's a little overwhelming. And sometimes you just need to Usa, but then, you know, when everything comes into play or you see that finished product, it's like, okay, that's why. So yeah, no doubt about it. Now, growing up, were you very into sports? Were you playing a lot of sports? And of course, I have to ask you, was Randy Moss your favorite NFL player? <laughs> <laughs> I used to actually tell people Randy Moss was my uncle. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Back in elementary school, because Moss was such like a, it still is, but it's such like a not so common last name. It's a very small group of people who have the last name Moss. So if you're a Moss, people automatically assume either Santana or Randy. Right. Santana I used to get when he was with the Jets and then when he left I would tell people Randy Moss was my uncle yeah so I mean I used to run that a lot but um I played a few sports in school I did soccer volleyball basketball um and then I watched heavily with my dad and that's kind of what I learned the game he kind of taught me and passed his fandom to me and as I got older it was more so not just watching for the um enjoyment of it but really getting deep and really in being invested in the logistics and the trades and the plays and the intricate details of sports that us fanatics really know inside and out, or we think we do, whichever way you want to go ahead and put that. Um, so that's kind of where, you know, my love kind of turned into like, I could do this as a job. This is, this is more than just, you know, passion. This could actually be, you know, somewhat, there could be some money here. <laughs> so what, what influenced your decision there then to attend Florida Atlantic University? And did you know you wanted to pursue a journalism degree there? Well, my parents are already living in Florida. Um, so kind of being able, to, I applied to a bunch of schools, but FAU, I had heard good things about it with my family already being here. It allowed me to not be so away from home, kind of be on my own because Boca is like an hour north of Miami where my parents live. Um, so it was like that aspect of being by yourself, but you know, if you want a home cooked meal, you don't got to get on a flight to get that. You can just kind of take a car and, right. you know, drive 45 minutes to an hour down. But, um, it was also cool too, because South Florida is a big sports town. Um, and it's become one in the past, I want to say 20 years or so you have the dolphins who are now relevant in the NFL. And, you know, you have the Miami heat who've been killing it throughout, you know, a couple of years in the NBA and are really a, guy, a group of young guys. And when obviously a big three, when I was in college, the big three was a thing down here in the 305. And that was everybody could not stop talking about them, all eyes on them. And then you have some other teams also, Florida is a huge state in general. So there's so many sports teams now, you know, the Bucks are here in Tampa, which is only 45 minutes north, north east yeah my geography is not that great but you know it was a good opportunity to kind of get my feet wet in a quote-unquote smaller market and then eventually go back home to New York and and try to conquer that bigger market so it's kind of what my thought process was a little bit 
You know, speaking of Florida, I am currently in the Orlando office. I'm by my uncle's house. We're enjoying it. Um, but it, it's nice you touched on Florida because I, I wanted to ask, uh, well, you mentioned Miami. So first yeah. thing, we got to get you a customized Miami Vice jersey so you can put up behind you. Because I won't do that. You, you, <laughs> probably, you probably represent Florida. You know, you got your connections here. Uh, going back to Florida Atlantic, uh, you worked there for the, the school paper. Uh, did you do any internships while you were there and you very quickly got a job right out of college. So, yeah. uh, did you do internships there and did the connections there help you get that first job very quickly? Because, you know, unfortunately it doesn't really materialize for people that quickly, especially in the world of media. Yeah. I mean, I didn't intern much in college. I didn't do my first internship until I was a senior in college. Um, I was one of those people who were trying to experiences that I could grasp and get on campus. I didn't really have, I didn't have a car. Um, so it wasn't like I could get to those internships easily if I did obtain one. And um, well, I had a car, but it was at my parents' house. They wouldn't let me take it to school probably because they knew better. Um, <laughs> so I wasn't looking for internships, especially, you know, when you're a freshman and sophomore, you're still trying to figure this world out. It's such like a culture shift, not only a culture shock, rather not only going from New York to Florida, but just making that transition from high school to college. It's such like a dramatic shift and it can be overwhelming trying to add another thing on your plate. So when I felt ready was really in my senior year, but I did things while I was on school. Like you said, I wrote for the paper. I did basketball and football. Um, I worked at Owl Radio, which is our radio station. I got involved with the production crews that did like different things within our school. So I found ways to kind of learn things outside of what the classes were teaching me. And then when I got my internship at the CW, it was, it was entertainment. It wasn't even sports. It wasn't something that I necessarily was interested in doing. I was talking about things that I wasn't necessarily um, a big fan of, like what is Taylor Swift wearing on the red carpet? I could personally could care less. Some people really like that stuff. That's not me. But it was a great opportunity to learn not only the the back end of production and television, but the front end. And I got lucky, you know, Phil Jackson has a really good quote when it comes to championships. He said, it's part luck. And that, you know, comes to staying healthy. And it doesn't matter how talented you are. If you can't be healthy, then you probably won't be able to win a chip. And that's luck. So the same thing is said when it comes to this career, in a sense, I got lucky my first internship, you know, fortunately, my boss had to step away for some personal reasons. And that was their guy. That was the face of the station and everybody else were behind the scenes people. So they asked me, hey, can you step in? And at the time I was like, uh -huh. but I was like, sure, why not? Sink or swim, right? And then from there, I was able to snowball that and that trajectory. And I actually ended up working on Generation Next, which is the home and the starting point of a lot of names that you know. Joy Taylor got her start there. Wow. Amina Smith, um, my girl Amina Smith out in MC, um, Boston got her start there. You look at MJ on the NFL Network, she got her start there. So it's like a little sorority of us who started at this very, very small show that used to um, broadcast on NBC here in Miami. And then from there, you just kind of snowball and you keep the trajectory and the machine running as long as you can. Yeah, so obviously during your, you know, right after post-college, college as well, we're on the same age here, social media really starts taking off. A huge focus on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, you know, you're getting all these, these on-air opportunities, a lot of silent reporting and other hosting jobs. How much of an impact positively for you did social media take on your career? A big impact. Once, once I learned how to use it correctly, I think you, as young, you know, I actually, when I was in college, I was a model um, as I was kind of getting my feet wet in this um you know, industry and you have to kind of learn. I had to learn a weird balance of being not too much of a model because it's like, oh, then you get into that stereotype while trying, to, but also having to, you know, promote certain photos and, and things like that because that's technically what's paying me more than what I am doing at the moment in time, trying to get my feet wet. So I think once I was in a position and that didn't happen for me until I got to iHeart when I got on sports radio and I started covering the heat and, and the dolphins and, and teams like that, that I really was able to take social media and use it to my advantage and, and use it as somewhat of a online digital resume. And when you're in this field, 
that's really what it is. You know, just like when you're a model, it's your digital portfolio. Or just like if you have a business, your Instagram is your business portfolio. It showcase, you know, what your business is all about. It's the same thing in this field. And yes, you know, people want to see aspects of your personality, but they also want to see what you do. And especially if you're in the position where you're looking for that next opportunity, which you should always be looking for the next opportunity, even when you're in an opportunity, then social media and how you utilize that's really important. So for me, that didn't happen until I was like 24, 25, when I really started to figure out how to use it to my advantage. Yeah, and you, you also do, uh, you did All In with your, your show, All In with yeah. Ashley Nicole. That was on YouTube. You did Nick's Fan TV on YouTube. So YouTube, very huge now as well. And you know now that people are just getting digital jobs. So you know, forget about TV. You do work in digital on TV, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities there at this point. Now, you mentioned radio, iHeart, our show, of course, on iHeart as well. So we're all in the yeah. same family here. Uh, how, did, how did the radio opportunity come about for you? Again, by chance. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where, you know, um, preparation meets patience kind of thing. You know, it, it's, that's what chance kind of is. Um, it's that weird intersection between the two. I've been working on sports documentaries after um, the show that I was on ended at NBC and doing covering just um, a lot of local sports teams down here in Florida covering high school and and soccer and all these different films and the films would win all these local awards at these local film festivals and one in particular um caught the attention of my heart which they asked me to come and promote the documentary and I go and what's supposed to be just an interview and, and a promotion of the film the higher-ups hear me on the mic and they hear me and, and the host kind of going back and forth and the next day I get a call have you ever thought about doing radio now mind you when you come from television, radio is like a step down. You know, you, you're you so used to being in front of the camera that radio is like, I've never thought about doing radio. Like, this is a TV case. This is TV. I'm, the, I'm a TV personality. But, um, you know, my mom really pushed me to kind of just take a chance on it. You know, I wasn't working steadily in television. I was 23, 24 years old at the time. I was really looking for the next thing. And it kind of fell in my lap. And although it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do, it ended up being a great opportunity, not only from a standpoint of a big stepping stone in my career, but also just another trick to put in that bag of tricks, if you will. And it, I really believe that it made me a better on-air personality. Radio, I recommend it to everybody who wants to work in television. People eat, breathe, sleep, dream, radio. That's all they ever want to do. But if you want to work in television and you have the opportunity to get your feet wet in radio and crack the mic, I absolutely recommend it. It makes you just a so much better journalist and a so much better just personality, interviewer, commentator, analyst, whatever it is that you're doing. Radio really is a great, great foundation to have. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't even consider it a step down anymore because I think when you do media, everybody needs to be a Swiss Army knife now. You know, you need to be yeah. able to make the appearances on TV. Uh, be able to do radio hits and stuff like that. Uh, I wanted to be a writer when I was younger. So uh, I think it, everything kind of goes hand in hand now. But I wanted to ask your influences uh, and your inspirations because you are in the field that you're in and you mentioned some really incredibly talented women before. So when you're in this industry, it's always in the back of your mind you don't really want to, I mean, you want to emulate people, but you don't want to mimic people. You want to stand out as you're on your own as an individual. So uh, who are some of your influences? Uh, who are some personalities out there who you kind of modeled your, your craft after? Uh, but at the same time, uh, what kind of you know, aspects of your personality do you, did you want to get across when you made that transition? Yeah, there's so many. I mean, first of all, you know, as a New Yorker, you're you're just abrasive sometimes. You know, you're a little yeah, too honest. Well. Yeah, you're just a little too honest. And I think um, sometimes you feel like that could run people the wrong way. And I think um, in the beginning of my career, that was kind of something that I was told to like calm down and tone down rather. But then, you know, from observing and watching other people, you know, you kind of take pieces of people that you 
you know, admire and you apply it to yourself. So for me, I like to say that I modeled my interviewing skills after Erin Andrews. I think she's an exceptional interviewer. She has a way of making her subjects feel comfortable. I think she has a way of really getting them to open up. Um, watching her interviews throughout my life, you know, I, I've taken pieces of what she's done with people, everyone from Aaron Rodgers to Dak Prescott to Ezekiel Elliott, I mean, the biggest names in the NFL. Um, and even her sign reporting, it's just, you know, she's really, really good at what she does. I think I've taken some of my bluntness. Um, I rather, I feel, I've already, I've already been very blunt, but I think that I've taken the comfort in being blunt and being honest and not always being politically correct and just saying it how it is. Um, I've gotten that or I feel comfortable doing that because of like Joy Taylor. I think she is somebody who's honest, she's authentic. You know, she's not gonna say what you wanna hear. She's gonna say how she feels. She's gonna keep it real. I think I've maintained my New York persona because Stephen A. Smith has made a career off of it. He's never gotten rid of his accent. He's never tried to not be a New Yorker. And I think I've gotten my kind of analytic basketball mind and really have focused so much on really understanding the details of the game from people like Doris Burke and, and Michelle Tafoya and women who are really not just commentators, but they truly understand the game that they're reporting on. And so like people like that, I've taken just pieces and kind of made it my own to make the jumbles situation that I am now. So those are probably my inspirations in the field for sure. Definitely some great powerhouse names there. So yeah. good people to, to model yourself after. Now it's been a very busy year for you, especially starting in March. So how do these opportunities come about for you with Sports Illustrated and SNY? Was there any sort of audition process and you know how did you get in contact for those roles? Just connections, you know, it um, was on Clubhouse, which is that app wow. that, you know, is kind yeah. of like a Twitter spaces. And um, we were in this media mixer room, I think that they do every week. And one of the producers from SI was in there and they were talking about how they're looking to create new content and, you know, they want to bring new people on board. And from that, I was like, okay, like, let's, you know, you reach out, you start having those conversations. You know, one thing about me is that if I want something, I'm going to get it. Doesn't mean I'm going to get it right away, but I'm going to get it at some point. So I was very persistent on, I want to work for Sports Illustrated. I want to make this happen. How can we make this happen? And it was months in the works. It wasn't something that happened overnight. Um, it was, we were in conversation for a very long time, but the visual aspect of it didn't happen until months after the conversations were happening. Um, with Fan TV, I was already on YouTube and I had come across their channel and I said, Hey, I'd love to be a guest. I'm a huge Knicks fan. Um, I did the guest spot. It was just a huge reaction because it's very rare that you see women on those types of shows. But not only that, it's very rare you see women Knicks fans, diehard Knicks fans. That turned into a full gig because it was just audience really liked me. From Knicks fan TV, SNY found me. They found me actually reached out and said, hey, would you like to do some commentating on SNY? That of course, I grew up on this channel, you know, being a New Yorker, that's where you used to watch all, you know, the Mets games, Yankee games when it was back in the day. And New York like, sports here. Yeah. New, yeah, New York sports. So you used to see all the Giants interviews and stuff like that. Even though I'm a Cowboys fan, I would peep the competition. Um, so yeah, it just, you'd be surprised. You kind of just finagle your way into one situation, how that one situation you can snowball into various other situations. So I say to people, if you want something, go get it. Not just because, you know, to be a go-getter, but also because you don't know how things trickle. It, everything in this business is a snowball. It's a pyramid. And you never know what the next layer of something is based on the foundation you've laid. So just do as many different things as you can, because the more you do it, just the broader your reaches, the broader your audience is, and the more eyes that see what you're able to bring to the table. Right. You never know who is going to be watching, who you're going to meet yes. with. It's all about networking in this industry. Now for you, what did you find most challenging or most different between doing radio versus mm. digital and TV? I think, you know, because you're out of TV for a while and you go into radio and radio is comfortable in a sense of you don't have to worry about what you look like, right? You don't have to worry about your mannerisms and your posture and your facial expressions. And 
you're really just focusing on your voice and your knowledge because radio, you know, you can't fake the funk. You know, if you don't know what you're talking about, there's no cut, we'll do it again, you're live. <laughs> like, and radio listeners are not afraid to call you out. Right. Um, I think when you get back into television, you then have to go ahead and add all those other aspects. You have to worry about how you look. You have to take a little bit more attention to detail. You have to make sure your facial expressions aren't reacting to something as a fan more as an ad. Like there's so many other things you have to worry about because it's a visual now. Um, so that was the biggest difference to me. And I think also, um, I think really just realizing that people can see you, not necessarily about your looks, but just knowing people can see you. It's not like you can hide behind your ambiguity anymore. You know what I mean? Now it's like, if you say something I don't like, I have a face to that name. I have a face to that take now. Now I can't, you know what I mean? And that opens a whole different can of worms in terms of, you know, social media and trolls and, and attacks and things like that. And I think that was something to get adjusted to. Um, so I didn't have to worry about that so early in my career. Didn't have to worry about that in radio, but in TV, especially now with social media, like, you know, we alluded to before, people know exactly what you look like and how to find you. And that's a whole different camp worms. So those are probably the biggest, two biggest things. Yeah, well, screw the haters. They suck. <laughs> right? <laughs> um. We always ask the question regarding the agent because mm -hmm. helpful for some people, but some people are very clearly articulate and well-spoken and can handle themselves. And you yeah. seem like one of those. So do you have an agent? Uh, are you represented by anybody now? And if you are, would you recommend it? And has that helped you along in your career? I'm not. Um, I think I'm now in the process, I feel comfortable in the space that I'm in to start kind of stepping into that world, at least entertaining it more. Um, here's the thing. You can't, I, I tell people this when I, it comes to agents, you can't look at an agent as Superman. He's not going to come in and save the day or she. You're not going to come in and save the day and, you know, make something out of nothing. It's not somebody who's going to let you, you know, you can just sit and lay back and drink a pina colada while they do all the work. That's not what they're there for. For the most part, they usually come in on the back end and they're just, you know, wheeling and dealing and negotiating what's already in existence. So yeah, sometimes, you know, they are the ones solely responsible for bringing opportunity to the table, but that's their job. Their job is really to negotiate. Their job really is to make sure you're not taken advantage of. Their job is to make sure that they get paid handsomely and you get paid handsomely. And if you do along the way get opportunities from your agent because of that, that's great. I will say that for people who are looking for an agent, think of an agent more so as a tool in your toolbox versus, you know, the entire box. So like I say that to say, if you're going to, you know, agents like a wrench, you don't always need a wrench, but when you do, you have one. But if you need to hang up a picture, you're going to use a hammer and a nail. The wrench doesn't help you. So just look at it as another, you know, member of the team versus, you know, the captain of the team, because the captain of the team is you. And if you're someone who's able to kind of find your own opportunities, do that for as long as you can until you can't do it anymore. Because one, all you're going to have to do is split whatever revenue you get with another person. And if you don't want to do that, especially in the beginning when you're not really making that much money, I know people see, you know, they see you on TV and you think they think you're rolling the dough in the beginning. It does not happen like that for most of us. Um, that's just the percentage that goes to somebody else. So if you can kind of wheel and deal and, and navigate on your own for as long as possible, I definitely recommend that. And when you get in a space where you feel, okay, I got a lot going on, I can't do it. Um, then look into it. I would actually recommend, this is what I have, like a manager publicist before an agent. Uh, manager publicist is, is a little bit better because they just help manage what you're doing. Um, and publicists just help to get you publicity. But agents tend to, you know, be a very sticky situation. So if you don't need one, I wouldn't actively look for one until you do. It's a great analogy. Phenomenal yeah. answer. Very different. <laughs> what you got. Uh, and on the pina colada sounds real good too. I know. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's the Miami thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I personally do not know this. So this is a question for you. Did you ever do play by play or did you ever consider uh, a career 
doing broadcasting on the sidelines, maybe in the vein of Adoris Burke, because you mentioned her. I was going to mention her later on, but you know, glad you hit that first. Um, yeah, we, I follow your Twitter. I don't know if Nick does, but yeah. I think your knowledge of the game is really good. Uh, I think you have a, a tremendous sense of the game that a, a lot of people don't necessarily have on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so have you ever considered the possibility of, of maybe doing by play by play or maybe being an analyst, you know, for TV? Well, first of all, thank you. Um, I've never, you know, in college, I did do a little color commentating and I loved it. Um, I think everybody has their strong suit and I think everybody has their kind of niche. For me, I could do it, but I think I'm a better analyst of the game. I think a color commentator is, I think people underestimate how difficult it actually is. Um, you know, you're part analyst, part color commentator. So you're doing both. Um, I think my strong suit is the more analytical aspect. You know, I'm not the, I don't want to be the one, you know, saying, okay, from the corner pocket, he shoots three and he hit, you know what I mean? That's just not me. Um, I like to more get into the deep analytics of not only what's happening on the court, but what's happening off the court and what that means. Um, also, I enjoy the storytelling aspect of sports media. You know, for me, the reason I got into it, not only because I love the game, but I wanted to tell the stories of these athletes outside of the game. I think so much we get caught up in the wins and the losses and who had this many points and this many rebounds that you forget that these are people and every person has a story. So as much as I love debating, you know, Paul George, you know, way off P versus playoff P and, you know, as much as I love debating, can KD do it by himself? And, you know, that's, I love those conversations. I live for those conversations. I thrive in those conversations, but I also want to tell the story of, you know, how did Paul George get to where he is now? Why is he here now? What does he want to do after basketball? Does he have any aspiration? What is he doing while he's playing ball to kind of prepare for the future? Kevin Durant just won an Oscar. Want to get into that? I mean, there's so many layers to these athletes that their stories need to be told. And I don't think we always tell them. So for me, the storytelling and the analytical part is really where I get my most joy from. Um, the color commentating, I leave, you know, to the real goats, like Marv Albert you know, Mike Breen and Doris Burke, you know, that's, that's their bread and butter. I wouldn't even try to like step in that territory. I leave that to them. They're the goats for a reason. So. Fair. Yeah. If you could interview any athlete or sports media personality right now that you've never spoken with, who would it be? Ooh, there's a few. Um, I would love to interview Allen Iverson. Um, huge Iverson fan growing up. Um, I love what he did for the game of basketball. I love how he changed the game of basketball. Um, I would love to interview Damian Lillard. I just think that, you know, I just, first of all, I admire his loyalty. Like it's exceptional because I would have left Berlin a long time ago, but <laughs> that's why he's different than me. Um, I would love to interview Patrick Ewing being a Knicks fan. Um, the house that Ewing built, I would love to know, you know, just kind of pick his brain and how he's feeling about the Knicks and Clyde Frazier. I would love to really interview any Nick. Um, let's see, football, probably Emmett Smith, um, Tom Brady. Um, I would love to speak to some of the OGs, Joe Montana, um, you know, Dan Marino, you know, like some of like some of the people who are the reason that some of the guys that I'm fans of now are even in existence, you know, that even have a, a, a lane to play in. Um, I just think that the great thing about the present is that it's always kind of a repeat of the past in some way. So I would love to see kind of like how it started. I would love to interview um, Julius Irving, Dr. J, you know, just some of the guys who paved the way for the guys that I grew up watching, you know, before he passed, I would have loved to sit down with Kobe Bryant um huge Mamba fan he's the reason I fell in love with the game of basketball next to AI I remember watching him come out of high school and following him his whole career um I named my dog Kobe like it's it's you know he was um a big part of basketball for me so there's so many people Latrell Sprewell hanging up behind me here I mean the list goes on that is great um before we let you go you mentioned Damian Lillard <laughs> You mentioned maybe wanting out of Portland. Kind of seems like they're going to blow it up over there. 
Listen, Dame. Come on down to New York, baby. We got a lot of things for you. We can't listen. You can get pizza whenever you want. You'll never have to go ahead. Listen, I say all the time, Damian Lillard comes to New York City and wins this city championship. That man will never have to, one, pay for a meal in New York City for the rest of his life. Two, there will be a statue built of him in front of Madison Square Garden. His jersey will be retired in the rafters. I don't care if he's only been there for three years. Your jersey's getting retired immediately. Like you would be the king of New York. The king. We're saying Julius Randle's the king right now. No, Damian Lillard would be New York royalty. Like there's Patrick Ewing, there's Derek Jeter, there's Damian Lillard. Like it would be, and the day Damian Lillard retired, it would be like the Derek Jeter commercial. I think it was for either MasterCard or American Express, where he is walking around New York City, everyone's tipping their hat to the captain before he retired. That's the kind of treatment Damian Lillard would get in NYC if he came and won the city of chip. So Dame, if you want that story, if you want that shine, if you want that just immortality, not only in basketball, but in New York City, there's only one thing you got to do. You got to trade in the red and black for the orange and blue. As simple as that. Simple. We got, we got the rest. We got the rest. Sales pitch. The Knicks got to be <laughs> smart. Do not give Julius Randle a max contract. He will not win a championship with him. Yeah. I mean, I think Julius Randle showcased that he's a great player. I think if you can't judge a, um, you know, player's entire season off one bad postseason. I think all he's shown us, though, is that contrary to what we may have thought, I think Jerry was out. Um, he's not Batman. You need Robin. I mean, Robin, you still need Batman. Right. And I think when you get Batman, just kind of like how Kawhi and I think Paul George have that Batman Robin relationship. When you get him somebody who can allow him to not have to do so much work, but still contribute in the ways that he can contribute. I think you'll not only see a better and more confident Julius Randle in the next postseason. I think you'll see an all around more efficient Knicks team. Cause I think what we saw was you're relying so heavily on this one guy that doesn't really have it when it comes to being the leader of the franchise, that when he falls apart, everything around him falls apart. And when he gets double teamed, when he gets locked up, you don't have that other person to come in and try to save the day. And you can't rely on Derek Rose, love him, but he is 33, 34 years old. So that's not something you can do. Um, I think you go ahead and you get Julius Randle, someone like a name, you get him somebody like a Kawhi, you get him, you know, someone even like a Zion, Zion's pissed. Okay. Zion does not want to be in New Orleans. I told people this months ago. Well, this is what's going to happen, Ashley. He's got, he can be reunited with RJ Barrett. They went to Duke together. This is what's going to happen to Zion. LeBron James is going to sign wherever his son gets drafted, and then Zion's going to force his way there. That'll be a big new three. That's what's no. going to happen. Uh, <laughs> but it's going to be interesting. The best part of the NBA season is always the offseason. So hopefully the Knicks are active. Chris Paul, uh, are, they, are the Suns going to pick up a $40 million option on him? I mean, they should, but maybe they'll decline it and try to get him a long-term deal. He might be interested in coming to New York. We'll see what happens at Westbrook, but you're right. The Knicks need to get a mega star into the garden, and that's the only way they're going to advance, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a lot of forward momentum, though, this season with the Knicks. They overachieved a little bit, kind of slightly disappointed in the playoffs, but now that we see the way Atlanta's played against Philadelphia, that doesn't look so much as a, a, like a disappointment now. But um, a lot of forward momentum with the Knicks. Uh, they're on their way up, kind of like our guests. So, uh, <laughs> Ashley, thank you for joining us. We really thank appreciate it. Thank you for having it. me. Yes, uh, we know you've had a busy day, so we'll let you go. But uh, what we do here is on our podcast, we always give our guests the last word. So if there's anything else you would like to share, if there's anything else you would like to promote, go right ahead. The floor is yours. You're excellent. Terrific guest. You know, good luck this summer. Good luck next season. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have you again uh, on again real soon. Yeah, I mean, you guys can follow me on social media at Ash Nicole Moss and just kind of keep up with me and my crazy takes and not so crazy takes because a lot of them are right, but that's a different conversation. Um, <laughs> go Knicks, first of all. Um, obviously, Philly's not handling the job for me. I was rooting for them. Now I see why I don't root for them, why I'm not a 76 fan because they can never do anything right. Um, and for, I guess, for anybody who's, 
trying to um, get into the field and, and get into, you know, in whatever aspect it may be, I would say, you know, it gets, it's hard before it's better. And I think that, you know, there's this meme that I think of off the top of my head of like this guy with like this, you know, ax almost. And he's like underground, like knocking away at the bedrock and he's gotten like 90% of the way done. And behind this last bit of rock is the diamond. He's like, you know what? I quit. I don't want to do it anymore. And I, for people who kind of, you know, may feel like that is you never know how close you are to hitting that diamond behind the bedrock. So just kind of keep chipping away at it. And I'm a firm believer. And yeah, it's a little bit of luck, but it's a whole lot of hard work and just perseverance and determination and, and skill. And just like, you know, you don't always have to be the most talented. You just have to be the hardest worker. And, you know, you can't, so you can't sometimes compete with God-given talent, but you can always compete with hard work. So just don't let anybody outwork you and the rest just will fall into place. So, Great words of advice there for all listeners. So that's going to do it here for this episode of You Know I'm Right for our very special guest, Ash Nicole Moss, and for our, my co-host, Joe Calabrese. I am Nick Durst, and this has been You Know I'm Right.